Hi both, thanks so much for joining us. This is uh, Miles Allen from Oxford University and Mark Kemba. We're going to be talking about the role of offsets. And I'm going to start by asking you, Miles, is there a role for offsets in reaching net zero emissions and 1.5? Because I think lots of people say there isn't at all. Yeah, well, it is net, it's called net zero for a reason, uh, which means we have to recognize we will, we need to stop global warming before the world stops using fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. That's just something that everybody in this COP needs to get their minds around. And that means when we're at net zero, we will be compensating for remaining uses of fossil fuels with something that will look like an offset. Now, whether it's done yourself to get rid of the CO2 internally in your own operations, or whether it's done by paying a, a third party to get rid of your CO2 for you, the climate doesn't care. That, that's what net zero means. So that's where we, we've got to get to. Now, most offset transactions today look nothing like that. And that's where, yes, we've got more to talk about, about which offset transactions today are actually helping us get to net zero and which may even be slowing things down. So that, that's a really important conversation. Great. Okay, and I do want to talk about that. So earlier in the week, uh, no, last week, I was at an event at COP uh, where Mark Carney was talking about the importance of offsets, offsets, scaling up offsets, and he was uh, protested by Greta Thunberg and Jennifer Morgan from Greenpeace, and they were holding up signs saying, this is a scam and it's greenwash. Um, are they, well, are they, are they right to do that? I think that their argument is that you can't scale up the offset market and have a high quality offset market at the same time. Do you agree with that, Mark, or is, is Greta wrong? So no, I, I was at that event. Yeah. Um, so um, I saw, saw and heard what went on. I think the, con the concerns that Greta and the representatives from Greenpeace and ActionAid and many of the indigenous leaders who were there were absolutely well founded. I mean, we know from the history of of, of voluntary and, well, and CDM projects over the last 20 years that there have been projects that have, haven't respected the rights of indigenous people and in local communities, haven't taken into account the needs of those communities, uh, perhaps have overestimated the emission reductions that have taken place. But on the other hand, there have been a lot of very good projects that have driven finance to important development issues, have reduced emissions uh, and avoided it well, and removed emissions. So. I don't think it's sort of, sort of binary to say they're good or bad. They can be good if they're rooted in science, if they're above and beyond what corporates uh, should be doing in terms of getting on the path to net zero that uh, Miles mentioned. And we heard last week, week that the UN Secretary General is setting up a panel to try and define what net zero means for non-state actors. So I think if we're looking at, you know, Miles talks about this path to net zero sometime by mid-century and companies should get on a science-aligned pathway to do that, but they will still have some remaining emissions. And my view is that if they can be done, and it's an if, if it can be done well, i.e. it respects, um, well, it have conservative baselines so the emissions aren't overestimated, they're done in, not only in partnership, but driven by local communities, and they support countries' climate plans, then I think they can be very valuable in driving finance to areas where it's really needed over the next 10 years or so. And have you seen, you've been, you've been to COPS before, have you seen this level of interest in offsets previously, or do you think we're kind of entering a new phase where um, they get, they're under extra scrutiny? Well, it comes in waves. I mean, there was a, a boom in the, in the first decade of this, of this century where you know, pe many people, I think probably exaggerated, thought the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol might solve all the world's ills. Um, and that clearly was uh, unfounded and you know, uh, over-enthusiastic. And then there was a sort of drop-off. And we, as you know, in the last couple of years, we've seen that the voluntary carbon markets in particular have started to grow. I think Ecosystem Marketplace said it could be worth over a billion dollars for the first time this year. So there's clearly interest. And I think some of that interest is genuine desire to go above and beyond and drive finance, particularly to developing countries, to support their climate action. And there may be others who are thinking this is an escape clause. So, yeah, go on. I, I was going to say, the, the, the situation has changed since we were last sort of in this, in this enthusiasm for offsets. And that back in the 2000s, the goal was roughly halving emissions or maybe, you know, that, that's what people were talking about. And if that's your goal, then there's plenty of scope for the use of offsets in managing that smaller volume of emissions that you're aiming for. Net zero changes that logic 
completely. Mm. Because we're no longer aiming for essentially reducing emissions in rich countries and not really worrying about too much about emissions in poor countries, which was kind of the Kyoto yeah. model, because the science now makes it very clear we've got to get global carbon dioxide emissions to zero. So as you and, and as we're heading for net zero, I think the really important thing that the offset market and everybody playing in it needs to recognize is the role of offsets needs to change between now and net zero. And, and that sort of transition, that, that transitional role is something I think a lot of people need to, to grasp because people are investing against this market and therefore they're, they're, they're making a statement about what they believe the future will be like. And that statement needs to be, as, as Mark says, based on science. So we were talking earlier in, in the previous panel about Article 6, I want to ask you about that, because that's what, that's what the big question is here at, um, at the COP. Um, I want to start by asking, as I mentioned in the previous panel, there's a clause in the current draft which says companies have to correspondingly adjust as well as countries if they trade under Article 6. So even though companies aren't actually in the Paris Agreement, in that situation they they become, you know, they become uh, subject to the rules of the Paris Agreement. Is that, is that significant? Well, I think it's recognizing something which is sort of the elephant in the corner in the whole Article 6 discussions, which is that if a company pays a, a, a forest, forestation project or something in Brazil um, for its carbon, and then Brazil counts that carbon towards its NDC, it's double counting. So uh, how are the numbers actually going to add up? And I, I, to be honest with you, I don't understand what that clause you've quoted actually means, but it's a recognition that there's an issue here. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's... I, I think on, on the plus side, I think we have to recognize that all these really complicated headaches with Article 6 will disappear as we approach net zero. Right. So, so to some extent, I think we have to keep this in perspective. We've taken 30, no, 97 to present, I can't do the maths, but whatever it is, 20-something years arguing over you know, offset processes since Kyoto. Now, within the next 23 years, we're going to have to be at net zero or pretty close. So if we're going to argue about offsets for the next 23 years, by the time we've finished arguing, it'll be completely irrelevant. So are we arguing too much? Do you think we should just let them get on with it? Well, I think there's good to be got out of the, you know, well-designed offset markets today can serve a purpose if they're subject to the safeguards that Mark is, is describing. But we also have to recognise, and companies need to recognise, where we're going. When we published the Oxford Principles for Net Zero Aligned Offsetting um, last year, we really emphasised that if, you, if you're actually net zero aligned, your options for offsetting become much smaller as we approach net zero. Because we need net zero, above all, to be durable. There's no point in a net zero that's just an accounting trick that you manage to sort of con confect from some cocktail of emissions and removals in a particular year. Which unfortunately, is I think the way a lot of governments are thinking about it. Certainly, the way the UK government seems to be thinking about net zero, if they can, if they can manage to you know, balance the books in 2050, they're done, they're, they're, they're happy, and then they're really not worrying about what happens after that. No, net zero has to be durable, which means that fossil fuel emissions, which are totally durable, that once you burn fossil fuels, it's, it's out there forever, has to, will have to be balanced by equally durable removals. So that's a very specific kind of offset, which virtually nobody uses at the moment, which is capturing CO2 out of the atmosphere and storing it away permanently, either underground or back in some form of rock. Now, what we need the offset market to recognize is we need a transition from where we are now, which is the offset market entirely dominated by either paying for emission reductions or paying for nature-based uh, removals, afforestation-type projects, um, to a situation where the offset market's entirely dominated by something which is completely different from the transactions that we're talking about today, and which is a couple of orders of magnitude, you know, 100 times more expensive. And, and that's what I think we need companies to recognize. And if, if, if in the sort of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if Shell was heavily involved in the offset market if they also came out and said, by the way, we've got a transition plan, and by 2050, any fuel which we're still selling, which we're claiming is offset, will be offset by direct air capture and geological storage. And we're going to put the cost of that on the price. So, you're, yeah, you're touching on a point I wanted to ask. So, if, 
if I as a company wanted to offset my emissions, what's the best kind of offset that I could buy? You talked about direct air capture, but there's also a question around how it's stored and how safely it's stored, isn't it? So the, the, talk us through it. It's quite a small number of actually very, very high quality offsets on the market at the moment, isn't there? Uh, uh, to be honest, I, I have a slight problem with this quality of offsets okay. as if it's sort of just a scale. I mean, different offsets do different things. And I, I would say, I wouldn't want the private sector to, as it were, spend all its money on capturing a very small amount of carbon today. I mean, there's a certain amount of money available for these projects, and you know, companies don't have unlimited pockets. I wouldn't, so I wouldn't want, sh no, sorry, we, we mentioned Shell, why Can not? Can you talk about Shell, don't worry, it's It's a nice convenient label, so <laughs> with, well, apologies to, to any <laughs> Shell people in the room. Um, but, um, uh, it's, and, and because, it, well, also because, you know, credit to them, they're taking their responsibilities seriously. We can seriously, talk so. about BP. We can talk about BP, well, we can talk about anything. <laughs> but the point is, um, a hypothetical company uh, wanting to offset, they, they're going to have a certain amount of money they can spend on it, or they think their customers will tolerate. Now. Devoting all of that money to the most expensive option means you're only offsetting a very limited fraction of your emissions as a result of, you know, you're, you're going for the only, only the gold-plated Rolls-Royce variant. So what makes more sense is a mixture, um, but put some of your investment into these offsetting options that we know we're going to need in the future so that they can be scaled up and recognize that transition in your offset portfolio. So, you know, start with, by all means, using the most cost-effective emission reductions, high-quality nature-based solutions that we have available today. There's huge opportunities there. They can be done at, you know, they can be achieved at relatively low cost, which means also high volume. I mean, low cost doesn't necessarily mean lower integrity. It, it, it can just mean you, you get more carbon out of the atmosphere. That's a good thing. For, for, you know, you get more, more carbon for your dollar. But the you, in so doing, you've got to recognize that that's not going to last. Mm. That we, we need to transition to um, air capture, so you know, basically taking CO2 actively back out of the atmosphere. If we're still burning fossil fuels and putting CO2 into the atmosphere, it, we've got to be taking it back out and it's got to be being stored away permanently. And, and we've only got you know, less than 30 years to build that industry and we need to build that into the way we use offsetting today to ramp that up, to make that transition. So are you, are you skeptical that some of these technologies are going to be commercialized in time in order to be able to deliver? On I'm 100% confident they could be, and, and Mark could probably comment to this, but what I, 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 at the moment, the offset market doesn't really differentiate. It doesn't really differentiate by permanence. It doesn't differentiate by origin of CO2. Um, I mean, mm. there are, yeah, there are, yeah Mark's changing. right, you know, that is changing. But um, we, we, need, we need people playing in this market to, 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 to recognize the, the need for that transition so that they don't just declare we're offsetting X tons, but of the X tons that we're offsetting, you know, this much is going to these um, permanent, you know, uh, captured out of the atmosphere offsets, which will, which will still work in 50 years' time regardless of what the rest of the world does and the rest is going on these high quality, um, lower cost options today. Well, I, th I think this, you get, part of this, the issue here is the balance between investing in technologies so they become more affordable. Mm. And so if we only go for cheap, inverted commas, lower quality offsets, then that may or may not be diverting attention from investment at the technology development and deployment and testing level that we need. So I, th I absolutely agree with you about the balance. I think to assume that the offset market or market for voluntary carbon credits is going to drive the, de the, the you know, the decreasing cost for direct air capture, it's On just not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, we saw with renewables, there was a, a carbon market, there are carbon markets, the EU emissions trading scheme and also the clean development mechanism. But the, you know, the cost decrease in solar and wind was driven by direct government support through feed-in tariffs and mandates. And I think we're going to need the same for you know, uh, geological sequestration, direct air capture. So I, I think they're part of a bigger picture. And one of the concerns about voluntary use of carbon credits is that it will substitute for the investment and the effort that should be put in decarbonisation. Yeah. And so, you know, the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, very clear about the fact that this must be in addition to and not a substitute for. So companies should be 
on their deep decarbonisation pathways. They should be investing, as you say, in the technologies, you know, in, the oil or in the fossil fuel sector, the technologies which will allow them to be net zero if they are should be producing and using fossil fuels at all in 30 years time. But I think there's a, a carbon market in the short to medium term, which allows the investment in you know, protecting nature, in yep. low carbon development. And so I think you're right about the scale of high to low quality. But one thing that's really important is if there is an investment going into, for example, a developing country to support its NDC, that the offset market isn't just hoovering up all the easy to do cheap stuff, and that's why one of the things we've been doing, I think many others too, have been working with countries to say, as part of your NDC, as part of your, you know, your, your the, sorting out the money that you require, that think about carbon markets to go to some of the more difficult things, the bits that yeah. you need foreign investment for, because many of the lower cost things, governments can do themselves. Yeah, and, and that, that's a really good point about not allowing rich companies to buy all the cheap options now how, how, do you not, how do you not allow them? How do you stop them? Well, one way is for countries who, often in the voluntary carbon space, have sort of taken a back seat or been sidelined to say, this is what we want the investment for, mm -hmm. for these sectors or for these transformations to finance the just transition in, for example, our brick making sector or our palm oil sector or our land use sector. And we will only accept investments in these areas. And this is how the benefit sharing is going to work. And this is where, how we're going to use the profits. And this is who needs to be involved. And that may put the price up a bit, but it means that the finance and the investment is going to things that the countries and their, their communities are defining what that they need rather than someone else. And, and just to sort of add to that, there's also, you could also take sectors that you could argue can perfectly well afford to do things. So you know, take aviation as the, the classic one, which everybody sort of worries about offsetting. I, I, I would... Uh, at the moment, under Corsia, you know, aviation is, to put it bluntly, sort of hoovering up the cheapest, lowest quality and offsets. Corsia is the Sorry, aviation, the, the, yeah, the, 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 Corsia is the aviation industry's offsetting. Yes, and it, it's entirely based on afforestation type projects and av uh, avoided emissions. And um, the, in, you know, all of the, um, it's absent some technological breakthrough that nobody anticipates at the moment because, you know, aircraft engines last a long time the aviation industry will still be using fossil fuels in 30 years' time. So, and, and they should not be trying to claim they can compensate for their use of fossil fuels in 30 years' time by planting trees. You know, you can't turn rocks into trees indefinitely. That just doesn't work. So, you know, the aviation industry needs a plan um, a, and a published pathway of how it's going to get from where it is today to every tonne of carbon embedded, uh, carbon dioxide coming out the back of their jets being captured, recaptured from the atmosphere and disposed of permanently by 2050. And frankly, if the aviation industry showed that plan and showed how they were going to ramp that up, if they want to compensate for the rest of their emissions by afforestation in the meantime, that's great. But what I need to know is that they've got their eyes on the destination. So this comes into the question of corporate claims, because the thing about the carbon offset market is it, there's questions about the integrity of the sellers, but also the question of the buyers and what they're doing with that offset. And one of the big questions around corporate claims at the moment, we talked about aviation, I think, it's, I think it's EasyJet say, oh, we've got carbon neutral, carbon neutral flights because we're offsetting. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is that okay? So, because I, I, cause there's a... <laughs> there's Do you want to speak to that? <laughs> I will. There's, to. there's an argument that you can say, oh, well, we're not using, if I'm, if I'm right in thinking, that we're not using offsets to claim net zero, but we can say we're carbon neutral on the path to net zero. That's right, isn't it? There are all sorts of claims that many companies make. I, I've, to, I've, told, I've told people this week how I moved house early this year and the removal company, this tiny little local company, said carbon neutral across the bottom. And I asked them what they meant by that. I don't know, mate. We bought some offsets from someone down the pub. That was kind of, it wasn't quite like that. But it, 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 it was a bit like... Pub they're going to, yeah. It was a little bit like that. I'm exaggerating for effect, but you know what I mean. So I think one of... So I, I think, as you know, I'm um, running the uh, Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, which was set up precisely to look at how claims should be defined. And so, and it's partly driven by those companies that are doing the right thing, which is they have committed to a science-based path pathway to net zero. That includes making a commitment to more or less halving their emissions over the next 10 years, that they've, you know, that executive pay 
is linked to succeeding on that, that they've allocated capital to make the investments that will get them there. So they're really proving that they're on the path. And so, and it's driven by civil society and consumers who want to know when they see a claim about we're carbon neutral or climate neutral or climate hero or net zero, what does that actually mean? Does it, have any, does it mean anything at all? So one of the things that we've been thinking about is what is the pathway to regulate that? So regulate the claims. For example, we have the Advertising Standards Authority here. They should be able to judge that a, an advertisement or a claim like the one you mentioned, whether it's true or whether it's misleading. And then if it's misleading, um, you know, to remove that advertising. We have uh, the sort of fair practice in the European Union which allows companies to be fined a certain part of their revenues for misrepresenting the public. So I think w one of what we're working on is providing a practical but very robust piece of guidance for how companies can make claims, what they need to do both in their decarbonisation and the kind of carbon credits they're using, and then we'll work with governments and regulators to ensure that that is enforced. And on these claims, one, one which I feel very strongly about, which at the moment I don't think is adequately represented in either the science-based targets or indeed in, in this whole UNFCCC process, is that you can declare yourself net zero by continuing with business as usual up till 2049 and then shutting up shop. Um, you know, that doesn't make sense. If, you're still, if your business still involves the use of fossil fuels, you need to be decarbonizing the fossil fuels themselves, not just saying, I'm going to get a bit smaller or diversify into other areas um, in, as, as, your, as, as part of your, uh, your, your strategy. So, so I, you know, I, I think that's, that's one thing which is very badly, under, badly misunderstood in, in this whole market at the moment, is that just getting rid of fossil fuel assets by flogging them off to somebody else who probably cares less than you do, that's not delivering a net zero world. We've got to decarbonize the fossil fuels themselves. Yeah, and that's actually potentially making things worse as well. Uh, but that's, an, that's another conversation <laughs> to be had. Um, so Akshat and I were trying to come up, we wrote a newsletter a couple of months ago, we were trying to come up with a term, and obviously this is the, what you're working on. We came up with carbon responsible. Okay, if you're not, not carbon neutral, you're carbon responsible. What, what about you? Have you got any ideas of what a company could call themselves if they are buying offsets but they don't want to claim that they're carbon neutral or net zero? Well, I mean, we spent a lot of time arguing about this uh, over the Oxford Principles, and we came up with the phrase net zero aligned offsetting. It's a bit of a mouthful, mm. um, but, but I mean, we're academics. <laughs> um, but but, but the, the point of it is that it's the alignment of your strategy with the end goal. And above all, I think we need clarity from companies on what, um, that they understand what the end goal is and that they're not counting on just indefinitely turning rocks into trees. And, and, you know, I think that's, that would really help because the end goal is not very far away. A lot of companies have set themselves net zero targets before 2050, yeah. which means that, you know, that, that they're buying aircraft engines today that they will still be using when they will be in a hard net zero world and, or, or when, they, when they envisage being in a, in a hard net zero world. So how, what are they going to do with what's coming out the back of those engines? I mean, they, that's what we need to know. So I think, I mean, you're right, you need to know what the end goal is, but what happens between now and the end goal is, is also important. We'll also determine how unpleasant yeah. the planet will be when we get to the end goal. Exactly. So, yeah, absolutely. How much we can reduce and how much we can remove today, tomorrow, the day after, yeah. is also very important. But I think that how we, what we call this is, is very important, but it, and it's got two parts to it. One is, is it credible? Does it actually have any meaning to it? And second, is it, under, is it intelligible and understandable to people who are increasing? I mean, I, I looked, at, um, looked at the newspapers over the weekend, and they are all full of full-page adverts saying, I'm a climate hero, I'm net zero, I'm carbon neutral, I'm on the road to this or road to the other. And I looked at it, I don't know what they mean. And then some of them had a little bit of explanation saying that some renewable energy that they'd bought had offset something else that they'd done. So... And as a customer or as a sort of general member of the public, I don't know what it means. Yeah. And I've been working on climate change for 25 years. So I imagine your average person in the supermarket is already bom ready bombarded with claims about fair trade or organic or natural or whatever it may be. Is just going to hold their hands up and go, I, I have no idea what to do. I'm going to buy the cheap stuff as usual. So I think we need something that feels both understandable and robust. And that's, that's the trick. Great. All right. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Miles. We've run out of time, but thanks for such an interesting conversation. I feel like I've learned a lot. I'm looking forward to understanding all about Article 6 over the next week, and I'll be calling you up to find out what you think. Well, tell me <laughs> if you've understood it. <laughs> thanks, Jess. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.